Welcome to COVID-19, The Orthopedic Response, a production of the Digital Orthopedics San Francisco Doc SF team and the UCSF Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I'm your host, Stefano Bini. I'm a professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, and we're thrilled to join by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons as a global convener to address and rapidly respond to the dramatic changes to healthcare patients and our communities. Uh, and we're grateful to have a global audience join us in this discussion. And I'm super pleased and delighted to have the honor of welcoming to the, the session Dr. Tad Vale, or Thomas Vale. He is a chairman of our department, the James L. Young Professor and Chair of the Department of Orthopedics, uh, past president of the Knee Society, the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, and the Eastern Orthopedic Association. He's also past director and vice president of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery that oversees the licensing requirements for orthopedic surgeons. So we're extremely happy to have you here, Dr. Vale. Thank you, Stefano. It's great to be here. Awesome. And we're gonna hear about the impact of what, how COVID impacted uh, an academic practice. So I'm gonna turn over the, the podium to you and bring up our uh, decks and look forward to hearing your presentation. Excellent. Are we uh, good to go? No yes, slides sir. up. Slides are up. All right. First, um, thank you, Stefano, to you and your, your entire team for uh, putting together a, a fabulous uh, program over the past few days in a very brief uh, amount of time. I know you all have worked uh, really hard, and this, this conversation that's occurring uh, internationally is exceedingly important, and I think uh, my comments will help uh, show you why in our setting, it's called uh, the title Complex Patients, but it's really a, a sort of a complex environment. And just to give you a sense, uh, as Stefano alluded to, um, I'm talking to the University of California in San Francisco. I'm the chair of the department there and also on the executive committee of the health system. This is a, a big university. We have 6,000 students. We've got 43,000 jobs. Uh, and uh, we um, have a big economic impact on the area. There are two children's hospitals associated with us, a trauma hospital, university hospital, et cetera. So you get the picture, turning on a dime is uh, not easy. Uh, nevertheless, and all of you on the phone call have experienced, uh, starting in November of 2019, life changed dramatically. And uh, for us in San Francisco, uh, we were running at full speed and really had to turn courts uh, instantaneously uh, due to an unprecedented uh, threat that we were experiencing. And some might uh, feel that we should have reacted sooner. I think there were indications from um, groups around the world that, uh, that we were at risk for something like this to happen uh, and before the virus came along. But now uh, we are uh, experiencing what you see from the Hopkins uh, screenshot on the lower right that this is this virus has pervaded communities around the world. The global awareness is exceedingly important and uh, the uh, experience of our colleagues uh, has shaped our response. And I wanna frame that a, a little bit because what we are experiencing now is very different than what we've seen in the past. Uh, remembering SARS in 2002, the Middle East Res Respiratory Syndrome from 2012 were devastating medical issues, but they didn't have the impact that the uh, new coronavirus has had on us. So starting in uh, November of, uh, of this year, of 2019, we became aware of this uh, in China and the impact that it was having in Wuhan. And that sort of started the timeline that's impacted our decision-making so I'm going to go through some of these main events, and then we'll we'll get more granular and talk about how we've reacted at home. But just to set the context for those of you from outside the country, what's what's happened in the U.S. The CDC confirmed the first case in the U.S. in in January, late January, on the 21st. Uh, a couple weeks later, we admitted a patient uh, to the university hospital, and that began the chain of awareness of this virus in our community and uh, looking at what happened in Wuhan, uh, having to react uh, quickly. Uh, we were using uh, Department of Public Health testing mechanisms that 
quickly became inadequate from the standpoint of scaling speed. So on March 9th, we began doing our own testing. Um, we started a command center. We uh, began to restrict meetings and access. Uh, a milestone for the Earth community was when the AOS canceled its annual meeting on March 10th. On March 11th, the World Health Organization uh, declared a pandemic. And uh, for those of you uh, from Italy uh, to say thank you because we were looking at what was going on around the world and we were hearing from our Italian leagues that you can make a difference. And that's an important message that I'd like to convey here that we've heard from our international colleagues and we believe that you can make a difference if you intervene. And that message was heard loudly. The, De the President of the United States declared a state of emergency on March 13th. About two weeks ago here in San Francisco, we went into shelter in place. Uh, the mayor uh, declaring uh, this order. And then for the whole state, uh, the governor created shelter place on March 19th. So give you a sense, these are the, the things that were going on in the world. <laughs> Meanwhile, this is what was happening with the global uh, cases. So you see in the blue now, on April, as of today, the last time I had a chance to look, over a million cases and in the United States about a quarter of a million uh, cases uh, globally. So this reflects that you know, while we were taking uh, some action, that exponential growth in the curve globally had already occurred. But there's more to it than that that, that, ref that is important for our individual planning. And this reminds me of something that George Rutherford said, that a, a pandemic is really a collection of epidemics. And these have different trajectories. So if you look at the growth in cases for China, for example, in green, for Italy and the United States in orange and blue, you can see very different trajectories, very different experience in, in, in different localities. And this is not normalizing for populations. So you can appreciate the burden in Italy and we've, we've seen it and we've heard from our colleagues about that. Another point illustrating the value of our international conversation is this article that gained a lot of attention here from the Imperial College in London, talking about how immediate action can impact the surge. And this really uh, has had great importance at our institution in terms of taking action and taking action quickly, isolating people, uh, closing uh, public gatherings, even home quarantine. So you can see that it makes a big difference compared to doing nothing. So what was the local response? <laughs> we really focused on safety, security, and capacity or treatment. The safety uh, has to do with the healthcare workers, the public, uh, the appropriate availability of uh, personal protective equipment, surgical masks. We can touch on this more because there's been a lot around surgical masks in the United States. Who wears a mask? What type of mask? In what setting? And I would say gradually it's become more with greater use of N95 masks in, in certain clinical settings. Security really means screening. Uh, early in March, we started screening people entering the hospital and entering the clinics and limiting visitors in the hospital. Uh, this is very difficult. People want to be with their loved ones, but it, it makes a big difference. And it makes a big difference not only for the uh, sake of the patients, but the uh, maintaining the workforce. The other important aspect of this is planning for capacity issues. Uh, looking at the projections of cases, how they would occupy the hospital, this impacts every service every surgical service, the orthopedic service, making beds available, making ventilators available, available and keeping track of our capacity. Uh, I, I, we don't have time to get into the ethics of this, but it really, uh, the idea of how do you uh, allocate resources when they're scarce is exceedingly difficult. And we've had a lot of conversations around how to maximize benefits, save the most lives. And uh, there's an excellent article of reference here from the New England Journal for those who want to read more about this subject. So on to the local response. You see here 
uh, listed in orange are the total cases in the U.S. and then what was going on in the U.S. after the CDC confirmed the first case. We admitted our first patient. We froze the operating rooms early in March, stopped international travel, started providing updates to our community, canceled meetings, and then the online meeting uh, really began to explode. There were things happening also out in the community that added to the gravity and the attention. One, of course, was the crash of the stock market, the financial impact. Another was when the uh, NBA suspended play, the National Basketball Association. It may sound silly, but it got people's attention uh, that this was serious at a time when the World Health uh, was declaring a pandemic, and you'd think that would be enough, but the popular culture really has an impact. We ramped up telehealth. We started screening patients, eliminating visitors uh, in the middle of March. We adopted uh, what the so-called Singapore model, and I think you've heard this alluded to from others. That is the idea of duplicating services and not overlapping so that you wouldn't have a complete uh, team unavailable, say, to do hand cases, emergent hand cases or trauma, uh, separating people. This included residents and faculty. Uh, in, and again, as I mentioned, confusion about PPE, who would be wearing a mask and a lot of conversation and moving target on that over time. We opened a new ward for COVID patients. Uh, we opened a, a new a hospital that had been shuttered and uh, have that coming online in the next week or so for COVID patients. And several hospitals in San Francisco worked together to actually open a hospital's ICU that was shuttered to make more capacity. So a real team effort. We began requiring masks at the hospital for everyone. Uh, and in, in the community now, uh, the politicians and uh, public health people are recommending masks for people who go outside. So that's a change. And we started to model the financial impact. Of course, that's taken a backseat uh, to the clinical care. In California, in San Francisco, uh, we really have three separate epidemics going on. You've got California and, excuse me, Northern California and San Francisco, Southern California around Los Angeles, where they have 10 times the number of cases that we have in the Bay Area, and then the Central Valley. So three separate epidemics. Uh, during the course of events, you can see on the red line that our orthopedic surgery dropped uh, you know, on the order of 90%, only doing acute cases. And you can see what's happened to the COVID cases in the blue line in San Francisco, gradually increasing on a linear basis. We haven't seen that exponential increase yet and hope that we won't that others have seen and you can see in the green and the orange uh fairly consistent in terms of numbers of hospitalized and ventilated patients so we prioritized our patients as i mentioned we don't have time to go into it only the acute urgent cases uh, are being done infections dislocations acute oncologic issues etc so Dr. Vail, real quick. So finally, what did we experience? Sorry. Yeah. I want to say that Stop. prioritization yeah. schedule that you showed us is also something we're using for uh, when we cancel patients and we try to track them. We prioritize them as a way to re afterwards. Sorry, I just wanted to, when the, the slide was showing, um, right? Correct. We're using that also as a tool to track patients we were uh, canceling. Yeah, if I just go back to it briefly, although it, it may be at a different level of acuity, those that were canceled and um, they'll have different needs in terms of uh, how they need to be rescheduled. Is it a two stage that needs to be reimplanted? Things like that versus those that show up in the hospital or the emergency room and, and actually have an immediate need to go ahead. But, but you're right, this prioritization scheme is going to be really important for all of us as we get to the point of looking ahead and saying, okay, how do we re-enter? How do we uh, restart? Uh, and this will be important. Um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, we're at various stages of dealing with this. Uh, some are in the middle of the battle, and you heard this from Italy and China and New York, and some of us are anticipating, and some of us uh, don't believe it's gonna come. Uh, so we've, we've got to get over that that part of it. And what happens next 
once there's a realization, okay, life has changed, the OR is closed, uh, there's a real threat, uh, getting out information to alleviate fear, uh, alleviate stress, uh, get uh, put misinformation straight. This communication is, is a really key part of the activity. And I spent a lot of time uh, doing that and learned a lot in the process. And it's not perfect, but it's important. Following that, then there's this coordination leadership, uh, setting up uh, lines of communication. I mentioned this command center that we have in the health system uh, has a, um, a download every day that people can tune into, find out what's going on. Uh, this, this type of leadership is really important. And then determining the reality of the surge. So here in San Francisco, where we sit, using information that has been provided by others, using our best biostatistics and epidemiology, we're trying to predict what comes next. Are we going to be more like Italy, more like South Korea? Is San Francisco going to be like New York? This is what we're trying to sort out. And then, uh, you know, the reality is life goes on. People are taking care of their kids. We, we have to get up and go every day. Uh, a week ago, I had a grandson born in the middle of all this. Just reminds me that um, we need to carry on. We need to look ahead as best we can. But I would say right now, we're sort of right there in the circle that I've outlined here between the reality of the surge, caring for the caregivers, uh, managing stress, making capacity. And we're not yet to the point of re-emerging, although we're beginning to think about it. How do you establish trust for people coming back to the hospital, reinventing ourselves with technology? And I'll just end with the technology piece. Um, there are a number of urgent technology uh, needs, and I've listed uh, some partners here, people who uh, and companies who are working uh, in uh, these acute areas. The, the guy in the mask there is Alan Dang, who's one of our own faculty, uh, started a 3D printing process to make surgical masks. But the technology needs that are ongoing uh, include things that have been discussed uh, on uh, this uh, telecast and other settings, but communication tools facing internally and, and out to the public. The ability to work remotely, um, the technology, the security associated with it, just getting simple things like swabs to do testing, masks to protect people, and then the more complicated things like uh, the, uh, the respirators and so forth, the, the beds. Uh, testing capacity, I uh, mentioned at the outset, scaling our testing capacity uh, has been a challenge. Part of it is just having the reagents available to do the testing that uh, we, we needed to do. And then decision making. Uh, some of this is exceedingly challenge. you're challenging. You're dealing with lack of availability, high demand, ethical considerations at every level. What operations are we doing? Uh, how, how quickly? Um, how do we allocate resources? And then the treatments and, and the staffing models that go along with it. So um, thanks to the uh, groups that we've uh, partnered with, and there are others uh, that um, maybe we can talk about uh, as uh, in the Q&A, if it's of interest. Uh, and finally, just uh, thank you for including UCSF and me in this uh, presentation, the opportunity to uh, hear from my colleagues around the world. And I wish you all uh, best wishes as you deal with this challenge. Those are outstanding, and I certainly invite our audience to ask uh, Dr. Vail questions. And Ted, thank you so much for that presentation and that timeline that uh, was very instructive in terms of what happened in our personal experience and, and also how we uh, responded to it. Um, the I'm going to just see if there's a question here. I'll just get straight to them, and then I'll ask some if there aren't any. So a lot of questions. We're, we're a big academic center. Um, What's our surgical volume across the service lines uh, per year? For orthopedics, you mean? Or? Yes. Yeah, I would say it's, it's between nine and 10,000 cases, something like that. And, and you know, right now we're 10 to 15 a week, something like that. 
Dr. Jedi Liengar is a orthopedic surgeon. He's asking for any eventual restart of elective orthopedic cases. Are you planning on initiating mandatory pre-op COVID testing? That's probably not a department orthopedics question. Have you heard anything from the university as to how they like to address this? Yeah. Hi, Jay. Good to hear from you. Um, well, you know what? If we had unlimited testing capacity, we would do testing. Uh, and I, and there's a lot of conversation around this. You may have seen some guidelines from the Mayo Clinic talking about doing CT scans and, and testing and um, uh, other, other screening, which is important to protect healthcare workers, because I think we're just beginning to understand the risk uh, to healthcare workers, particularly in the operating room, particularly for patients who are getting intubated or having procedures that aer aerosolize uh, the virus. So, these are ongoing. Now, this is balanced with the notion that uh, testing isn't perfect. If you test asymptomatic people, you're going to get false negative results. And that creates another set of, of hazards that need to be considered. So, um, yeah, I would say eventually we will do more testing, uh, but I'm just acknowledging that that's, that's not the only solution here. Exactly. The lack of testing uh, may not be maybe an option. In fact, we even had a call go out, I think, to the community for masks and people were delivering masks to the university because we were short. Is that right? Oh, yeah. It's uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, it, we've had anything from a, um, you know, one of those crates that comes off a ship with uh, you know, <laughs> 500,000 masks to a kid riding up to the loading dock on his bicycle with, uh, you know, three boxes and dropping them off. The uh, the response from the community, this has been very, uh, very heartwarming. And I, I, I saw it in New York with the, on the news with people banging the pots and pans and, and wishing well to workers going off to work. So, yeah, I think uh, there's there's a lot of coming together that is um, should be mentioned along with all the heartache that goes with this. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Dr. Ndeli, uh down here at Stanford, uh, obviously he's uh, got a long history of practicing in Italy, has a question from, he says, many of my Italian ortho colleagues are expecting a serious reduction in elective cases in the next year. Should yeah. we get ready to change our practice for a while? And I suspect that's a two-pronged question. One is the hospital is re reopened, maybe filled with people who have greater urgency than arthritic problems. But the other is fear of getting back into a hospital that may be still considered a place where people go to get sick. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mentioned that, you know, the trust issue, and that's kind of what I was getting at. You know, we, we have to be able to determine that where we're working is safe and then how we're dealing with people who will have the virus. And there are, you know, that will be ongoing for many months. You know, maybe we get past the surge and that's really what we're focusing on now. But then the virus will be in circulation in the community, we will have to have standards. We will have to figure out the appropriate testing and screening that makes people feel safe. Uh, so, Pierre, yes, uh, this is going to go on for many months. There's that aspect and also just the workforce aspect. You cannot turn things on immediately uh, once you've turned them off. Uh, there is, and I think Rand Schwarzkopf alluded to this last night. Uh, there's a process that we're going to have to go through and it'll be, you know, obviously the quicker, the better, but it's not going to be immediate. Um, well, uh, I have a question about that. Actually, when I get to your questions, um, uh, how are the staff and orthopedic surgeons handling the new reality? How are people, what's people's emotional health? Um, what types of support have you seen people need? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I sort of alluded to kind of the transition of uh, uh, emotion that's occurred with this. I, I would say congratulations. Are, I'm, I'm hit one button, Stacia. Congratulations are in order. Uh, people have reacted in a very positive way, but it's also very difficult. You know, we are not trained to uh, not operate. Uh, we're not trained to... Um, you know, be on the sidelines. So we need to figure out how to uh, contribute. And um, this has been very difficult uh, for uh, staff and faculty uh, 
to manage and not to mention stresses personally on their families and so forth. They're people like, uh, like all of us, it's, it's hard. And I just, not that we can't handle it. Um, nobody's asking for sympathy, but I think we just need to recognize that as being true. Um, there's questions about uh, stratifying uh, patients and who we're actually operating on at UCSF. Can you give a little more insight to, because I know we, we are operating, we're just not doing a lot of surgery. What kind of surgery uh, are we allowing to do at UCSF? Yeah, I, in sort of broad brushstrokes, I would say uh, acute infection, um, acute fractures, you know, where particularly open fractures, uh, you know, not the not the borderline non-displaced ankle fracture that, that can wait. But uh, you know what I'm saying, the, the type of things that really need attention, neurologic compromise in a, in a spine patient, somebody who's declining in epidural uh, hematoma, epidural abscess, that kind of thing. And, the spine realm. In oncology, it would be uh, may, it may be a patient who's you know in a in a chemo window, and if they don't have that surgery that was planned, it will negatively uh, affect their you know put their life at risk potentially. So these these things that have a high degree of uh, impact on patient well being is how how I would characterize it. Um, not the routine by any means. Um, when you were talking about we, we opened up these new hospitals, we worked with the city to uh, find uh, hospitals that were closed and we needed to staff them. Tell us a little bit about how we were able to find the people to staff them. When uh, Could you repeat it, Stefan? I'm not sure I understood. Yeah, sorry. We, we opened uh, several hospitals that were previously closed so that we can make room for COVID patients. But it's not just the building, the infrastructure. We have to staff it with people. And many places are reporting that they're having shortages of staff to, to people to staff the existing hospital infrastructure. Yeah, no, that's that's right. So we've we've really uh, we've reached out uh, to the community, community bring, bringing people back who uh, may have retired, uh, looking for travelers and other people who are coming from other communities that uh, you know want to be involved in um, doing things like this it's a work in progress uh, and you know we don't know to what extent we'll need all of it uh, so we've gone about creating the infrastructure and the capacity and are, are in the process of putting the staffing in place but you're, you're, you're correct it's complicated and there's some attrition you know you have of, of staff uh, you know, people who get quarantined, you know, what have you, that uh, others have alluded to that you have to manage. So, again, I think using the strategies that are, you know, people would expect uh, in, in recruiting and um, providing opportunity, making people aware that we're doing this and um, that there's a need. Uh, we had a talk from Dr. Center that was, uh, we will repeat again this afternoon. We went live very quickly with uh, telemedicine. Um, and we'll speak a little bit to the fact that we had an infrastructure in place to do that and your experience watching as the chair of the department, how we adopted to that new technology. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used it myself. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in some ways it's a compromise, but it's also really good. I think uh, if you can look a patient in the eye and uh, – answer their question and sometimes you have an image to look at and sometimes you don't you tell them okay well i can't make a final decision until we look at this x-ray and you know here's we'll make a plan to get one at the appropriate time depending upon the vacuity of the need uh but i think not all problems can be solved in a remote visit but many can and many patients are grateful simply for the opportunity to uh, have their concerns alleviated by a face-to-face -face conversation if it's only uh, creating a plan for the future that's that's valuable it may not be uh, solving the problem completely so uh, we've used it a lot uh, we our practice is we've got patients that come from many hundreds of miles away uh, as well so there's a convenience factor and then there's the concern there you know somebody who's living in a rural community where they don't really see the virus isn't really enthusiastic about coming to san francisco right. uh, where we have it in our community to be seen so 
there's some safety issues, there's some convenience issues, and I think there's some um, real reassurance that occurs using that platform. So I've, I've found it to be very, very helpful. Um, I have a question here about the economic, oh no, actually the, I think there's a strong interest in it, having you answered this question. Do you think there'll be a large move of hospital-based surgeons towards outpatient facilities because the expectation is they might get started earlier than the inpatient environment. We see an outpatient shift driven by this that may not have been, may not otherwise have happened. You know, I think there will be uh, some of that. Um, you know, it'll be managed in an appropriate way with, you know, patients who uh, are appropriate risk profile for ambulatory surgery. But I can say certainly, uh, you know, we have an ambulatory surgery center. We're looking at, all right, well, what part of our very healthy population that we have moved more slowly with, you know, doing outpatient surgery in the inpatient setting? Let's just move them over. Let's just say, okay, we're going to take these people and move them over to the ambulatory setting because we've shown that we can do them in the inpatient setting. So, yeah, I wouldn't say it's going to be a whole, wholesale change, but this is something that started before COVID and I think will be accelerated by COVID and will continue. So that, that trend that you're asking about, I think is an important one that uh, will only um, be furthered by the experience we're having here with this virus. So last question, I think before we, uh, we make it two more and there's a question from Gregor Rechnick and his question is what would the economic and health related concepts consequences be of not doing orthopedic surgery for a period of time at a global level it's a it's a broad question but he's wondering if you have any sort of overarching thoughts about that yeah you know what uh you have to advocate for musculoskeletal care here um you know uh, much of what we do isn't acute you can delay some things but it is to the detriment of the population you know, the, the skeleton isn't just a structure that you, you hang the organs on. It is important uh, from the standpoint of general health, other conditions that people have uh, impacting heart disease, uh, neurological conditions. And then there's the, uh, there, there, the acute problems that we deal with from the musculoskeletal standpoints. I, I think, um, as I was alluding to before, you have to prioritize. You have to balance what you can do with the resources that you have, and it'll be different from place to place, city to city. Uh, but the needs of musculoskeletal patients are important and they, they don't go away because of this. Right. Exactly. Um, so as we wrap up our session, what would be your, oh, oh no, there's one thing we didn't talk about. We're a big academic center, a residency program. Yeah, we heard from Rania. So, would you talk a little bit about what we've done? You mentioned the the, the, the cohorting that we did uh, following the Singapore model. Uh, how about our educational? Um, yeah, that and that's really program. on the clinical side. The educational side, I'll have to say, I have uh, been so impressed with uh, the remote learning that's going on. I mean, the the conference schedule has uh, marched on, and uh, it's been well attended, well appreciated. In fact, I would say it's even increased. So we're missing the hands-on learning if people aren't in the operating rooms. Uh, that's a challenge and we hope to get back to that. But um, yeah, the, the didactic teaching, uh, that has continued and uh, it's, it's going great. And I think also there's some work afoot to really share among residency programs, um, lectures and uh, learning opportunities uh, that would um, you know, be outside of our normal curriculum. So. Yeah, some some really good things uh, happening there to uh, counterbalance the the challenges that that, that we face. Uh, Anthony, well, thank you so much for expressing your opportunity, and sharing that with us. I thought that was a really great session. Um, we uh, unfortunately are out of time, um, but thank you to the audience for participating. Thank you for you for providing us that insight. Um, I am now going to quickly turn over to Shauna as she moves into our next session. And I'd like to uh, remind everybody that if they like this content, they can see all the prior lectures that we've had in the last two days and follow us at docsf.health, D-O-C-S-F.health. 
and, uh, and, and be part of our community. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day, Dr. Dale. Thank you.